aí, pessoal, mais uma vez, eu vou fazer uma o professor Laura Pérez. I would like to acknowledge uh, you to support me here, to support my research. My, my presentation um, is about three artists and activists, uh, African-American Faith Ringgold, uh, Chicano Rupert Garcia, and Afro-Brazilian uh, Abdias do Nascimento. Uh, it's about their trajectories and artworks during 1963 and 1983, the most important period of the Black Power Movement. And these three artists, they start to produce their artworks uh, during the 1960s. And uh, I think that their Aesthetics and artworks are important to uh, decolonize Eurocentric art history because uh, their artworks, based on race and ethnicity, can uh, 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 have another aesthetics that, as I said, can at the same time uh, decolonize this Eurocentric art history. So uh, I would like to begin with uh, Faith Ringgold, uh, an African American artist that born in 1930. Faith Ringgold born and raised in Harlem, New York City, where she attended the City College of New York receiving BA and MA degrees in art and education. In the beginning of the 60s, commuted to engaging with uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, she tried to join the Spiral Group, but was rejected by the Spiral co-founder, Homer Burden, because of her, her painting style. But in 1966, uh, Ringgold joined the Ed Spectrum Fine Art Gallery, uh, a cooperative space. And, and there, uh, in December 1907, she uh, had her first show and uh, showcased her American People series which had begun in 1963. Uh, this is one of the, uh, his painting on the American People series. It's the, uh, called Die in 1967. She produced this artwork in 1967. And these two panels, oil on canvas respond to the street riots uh, broke out in the United States during the 60s. Uh, Ringgold said uh, that she wanted to show an abstraction of what the fights were really <coughs> all about. And they had a lot to do with race and class and no one was left out. So she said these words, and the artist depicted the figures wearing business and fashionable dress to express how racial antagonisms uh, permeate all segments of uh, American society. So she, and also this, uh, this, Campus was inspired in the Guernica, the, the painting of Pablo Picasso about the atrocities of the Spanish <laughs> Civil War. So she was inspired by the, the Guernica. Uh, uh, actually, this uh, painting is now on, uh, at the New York MoMA uh, in a room with uh, another. Uh, uh, artworks of Picasso that, uh, because this, uh, this exhibition is trying to dialogue 
with Picasso's uh, other artworks. So, uh, and then this American People series, this die is there. And yes, it's, she, she brings together uh, black and white in this situation of violence. And then you can see in the middle of, uh, not in the middle, but in the second panel, almost in the middle, two kids try to help each other out. Uh, so it's a very strong canvas of uh, this series, uh, this Faith Ringgold series. <coughs> it's a, it's, and then it's a, a series of the 60s that she produced. It. And in the 70s, um, Ringgold continued her activism in the early uh, 70s. And she studied printmaking with Amiri Baraka's Black Art Repertory Theater in School. And she created the pop and op art political posters designed to help raise money for the Black Panther Party's Legal Defense Fund. So her designs incorporate the hallmark colors of uh, the Black Power Movement, red, black, and green. And then these uh, uh, political posters called Women Free Angela um, to support Angela Davis. And, uh, and for Amiri Baracas, it's a very important political poster because it brings together black power movement and feminism. <coughs> and this is one, another important political poster uh, produced by Faith Ringgold called United States of Attica produced in 1962 and the United States of Attica was the most widely uh, distributed green gold political poster of the 70s. This poster was dedicated to the man who died in 1971 at Attica prison uh, for demonstrating against the deplorable conditions and again, she used the red, black, and green. Uh, depicts a map of the United States. So the dates and other details of uh, infamous acts of violence that occurred are posted with each state such as race riots, uh, presidential assassinations, uh, and around the periphery of the map is a statistical history of the dead, wounded and missing in American wars, starting with the 1776 Revolutionary War and ending <coughs> with the Vietnam War. Uh, and also, uh, Faith Ringgold asked for people to add their all update information uh, and put it on the poster. You can see better in this side. There, the map of American violence is incomplete. Please write in whatever you find lacking. <laughs> and the top, uh, the United States of Attica, founded by the American people on September 13, 1971, at Attica Prison, New York, where 42 men gave their lives in a right struggle for freedom. So it's a very important political poster as well. And, and she produced a, a new map of the United States based on violence. 
And this is uh, uh, another important uh, uh, issue of Faith Ringgold uh, because it's a black feminist art and by the 17th she decided that any art activist that was not specifically feminist could not serve her needs. So she created with another with other black women artists, the, this group called Women, Students and Artists for Black Art Liberation. And they, in 1971, they present at the uh, Acts of Art Gallery in Greenwich Village, this exhibition called Where We At? Black Women Artists, 1971, that was the first exhibition in US history dedicated <coughs> solely to professional black women artists. So that was, uh, uh, that, uh, was uh, one of the important activism of uh, Faith Ringgold because she also uh, tried to, to open a space to black women artists in the art <coughs> world. Because uh, you will see later I will show uh, uh, a, a short video she will tell about this and it's interesting because now she is in the, uh, the great museums like uh, uh, MoMA, Whitney and, but she also tried to support another women, black women artists as well and in 1908 she starts to produce the historicals for which she eventually became famous. Uh, and the historicals are, are paintings <coughs> and prose at the same time. And Ringgold's art helped to reconstitute the perception of cults from women's work to high art. So this one is one of the most important, uh, who's afraid of an Aunt Jamaima? You can see it better. Uh, so she decided to rewrote the story of Aunt Jamaima and then the, the story could bring together uh, art visual and uh, visual arts and uh, uh, text. <coughs> rewriting the, the story of Aunt Jamaima and, and this is the, the short video uh, she talks in this short video about her trajectory and also about the story code on Aunt Jamaima let's, let's hear I remember when I was young and I would go into a gallery to show my work, the gallery dealer would look at my legs but not my arm. <clears throat> I was born during the Great Depression and I lived in Harlem. By the time I was a little kid, I always had my crayons and my, my father brought me my easel. Uh, I had my paint. of Aunt Jemima was my first story quilt. We know Aunt Jemima as this person on a pancake box. <clears throat> I rewrote Aunt Jemima's old story. She becomes an entrepreneur and she's just fabulous in my story. to sit around the table to talk to the curators and to the directors. You understand? But not me. The museum will open up to African-American artists, but you won't be one of them because you're a woman. 
Okay, I got it. <laughs> well, I decided I needed to get involved with women's issues. At the Whitney Museum in 1970, they had biennials there. They had very few women in any of them. The last one that they had, I believe it was like 2%, two women. I said, what percentage of women do we demand? So my daughter, she said, 50% women. You want 50% of the people in the finale to be women. You know, we blow our whistles. We had whistles, police whistles that we blew. We had eggs. I boiled mine and painted them black and put 50% on mine. It felt like we were doing something. And we were a part of the movement in America to equalize things. It's a visual image of who you are. That's the power of being an artist. Yeah, and the second art that I want to present to you is Robert Garcia, born in 1944 in French Camp, California. Uh, artist, researcher, and recently retired tenured professor of the School of Art and Design <coughs> at San Jose State University. In 1981, Garcia completed an MEA in History of Art in the University of California, Berkeley, here. He was professor here as well. And, and Garcia had actually served in Vietnam and Laos, where he guarded napalm bombs before going on to study painting at San Francisco State College, now university. And after participating in the 1961, uh, student strike there uh, in the San Francisco State College, uh, organized by the Third World Liberation and anti-war demonstrations. She started to make political posters to denounce the violence against Latinos, Blacks, and other minorities in the United States. And This one is Rayon, produced in 1968, was one of the earliest uh, political posters produced by Rupert. And this 1968 portrait uh, headlined by the emphatic, emphatic Rayon uh, is one of the earliest posters, and it was done uh, during the, the strikes, and it was, it is also uh, one of the uh, first uh, posters showing the iconic uh, image of uh, Che Guevara before uh, this, his image uh, become so iconic and famous. And during this time, uh, Rupert uh, became a part of the emerging Chicano artist movement in the Bay Area and contributing posters to the Galeria La Raza and their activities. And 
where he was a founding member in 1970. And uh, I also want to show to you this, this short video. Uh, this video was produced to the Magnolia Editions project during 1991 and 2011. But, uh, what is important for me in this video is just the first part, uh, because in the first part, Rupert explained why, she, uh, why he uh, decided to uh, stop painting and start to make political posters. The impetus was Alf Young from England, the instructor who was teaching part-time at San Francisco State, teaching painting. And he talked about his experiences in Paris and what students were doing there in terms of the rebellion going on and that they were using posters and, and silkscreen posters as a way to articulate visually their points of view. So when we heard that, we all seemingly in unison thought that's what we need to do. I was then a graduate student in painting in 68. At that moment, I uh, stopped painting. Making oil paintings or acrylic paintings didn't make any sense. <clears throat> Making multiple posters made sense. The silkscreen idea had such clarity and such simplicity and, and directness uh, in terms of idea and even in terms of the image that one can realize through the <coughs> subscreen, so graphic and so assertive, that it all, it, it's all made total sense for me. Magnolia is a fine art publisher. We publish it. The part of Magnolia Project is another project during a lot of periods. Oops. And, and so uh, Rupert decided to start making political posters to join the, the uh, third world movements against <coughs> uh, Vietnam War and supporting the civil rights movement struggles. And this one is uh, an important political poster that he produced in 1971 uh, called Libertad para los Prisioneros Políticas and I would like to read to you uh, what Rupert wrote uh, later in 1977 about this political poster so he wrote she was in prison at the time on trumped up charts connecting her to a, a conspiracy to free the Soledad brothers. It was clearly a setup to discredit her and get her off the street. Being a Chicano and developing an understanding of the common struggle of third world and other oppressed peoples, I supported her. One way of showing support for Angela's universal statement of human rights and freedom was for me to respond visually with a symbol that would represent Angela Davis and her beliefs. I wanted to use an image that would immediately capture the eyes of the passerby. To do this, I choose a large black shape and a smaller sienna shape to depict her. Shadow and skin texture. Peacock blue color was selected for the text. All of the shapes and colors were bold, flat and aggressive. The viewer couldn't help but be grabbed into, into a 
visual dialogue. With regard to the text, I used Spanish to express international solidarity between black and Hazard peoples and the solidarity with our struggling comrades in Latin America. I recall thinking especially of the Cubans and their struggles. So uh, this poster was produced to support uh, the Angela Davis campaign, and it's one of the connections and similarities with the Faith Ringgold's work as well, because she uh, also produced political posters, uh, but uh, Rupert, was during uh, seven years, he only produced political posters, and and another issue important for understand uh, Rupert Garcia's artwork is the issue on pop art and activism. So Garcia uh, appropriated of pop art, <laughs> using them from a Chicano and third world perspective to serve his aesthetic and ideological ends. Uh, another and important example of Garcia's radical portrait genre is the serigraph Picasso that he produced in 1973, created in the year the artist died. And Garcia said that he was playing tribute to the maestro and painter of the anti fascist mural. Guernica. So again, the, the influence of Picasso and Guernica in, in this moment mm -hmm. during the 70s and the year that he died. And, and the pop art for Rupert is a, a possibility to respond to another pop art without uh, race, without issues of class, and a white pop art. So he appropriated of this language to create his own aesthetic on this uh, pop art uh, artwork. <coughs> has a, a, a turning point in his uh, career. He began to feel that uh, his expectations for immediate significant change in the US social attitudes and behavior had been too romantic. So he became disinterested in the production of uh, aspects of the silk screen technique and after seven years of working exclusively in printmaking he stopped producing posters himself and changing medium from silk screen to pastel so he produced uh, uh, political posters do, between 1968 and 1975, just to engage uh, in the, all the struggles of that time. And we saw the reasons that he decided to stop painting. But uh, in 1975, we decided to start to make um, uh, artworks with pastel and this and he uh, still having uh, political issues in, in his artwork, but now not using anymore the, the silk screen. And so this is one of uh, important artworks of uh, this phase called Assassination of a Striking Mexican Worker produced in 1979, 
Uh, this image is based on the famous photograph Obrero and Welga Aficionado, Murder Strike Worker, uh, created in 1934 by Manuel Alvarez Bravo. And, and he, uh, 1978, one, one year before this, this pastel, uh, Garcia was invited to participate in a work in progress experiment sponsored by the San Francisco uh, Fine Art Museum. And the, the subject of the project was the worker. And Garcia seized the opportunity to make a picture of a murder worker based on this terrible photograph. So uh, he took a picture of a photograph and then he produced this uh, pastel painting. And it's part of the, uh, it's important to understand how Rupert Garcia works because he used to, uh, to appropriate as well of uh, public images and then fragment this, uh, make close-ups to produce another image. So it was a, a photograph that he uh, recreated in his own way. And the third artist is the Afro-Brazilian Abdias do Nascimento. Uh, Abdias was born in Franca, São Paulo, in 1914 and died in Rio de Janeiro in 2011. He was a self-taught painter and now nationally and internationally as a Pan-African activist. He also was professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo between 1971 and 1981 and worked as a congressman between 1983 and 1986, and senator in 1991, and between 1997 and 1999 in Brazil. And the majority of his artwork dates from the 13 years between 1968 and 1981, that Nascimento spent in self-imposed uh, exile due to repressive dictatorship in Brazil. So he came to the US in 1968 in the most uh, violent <laughs> moment of the dictatorship in Brazil. And he decided to stay here. He came to invited to to uh, a, a short research and then he decided to stay here because he was afraid to come back to Brazil and be arrested and tortured and all these problems that the, the country was suffering that time and, and in 1981 he came back to Brazil during the redemocratization of the country and in this artwork called Liberdade para Rua Omolu Azul número 3 produced here in 1969 uh, maybe I can translate it like uh, freedom for Rue Omolu Azul number three. Uh, this, uh, the college, the painting college, was his contribution to Rue Rue P. Newton campaign. Newton was the, as you know, the principal leader of the Black Panther Party. 
imprisoned and accused of a political assassination. Uh, this is also uh, an artwork uh, relatively early in Nascimento's career, in which he highlighted the role of the Orishas in daily life. So the Orishas are the dates of the Afro-Brazilian religion called uh, Candomblé. Uh, the Orishas came from the <coughs> Uh, Yoruba cultural and uh, cultural traditions. Uh, the Yoruba they came from West Africa, mainly Nigeria, but the name Candomblé it's a a Banto name. So the Bantos they came to Brazil from Central Africa, mainly from Angola, and in Brazil. The Candomblé is the name for the, the uh, Orishas religion. Uh, in Cuba, for example, it's Santeria. And this painting is not uh, indicative of uh, any special relationship between Hui and a Black Panther leader and Omolu, Orisha of disease and cure. Rather, in this case, the association is more about Nascimento's belief that there was, there was no clear separation between humans and gods, the secular and the sacred. For Nascimento, the Candomblé Orishas were very much present in all aspects of contemporary life in Africa and across the diaspora uh, and were not restricted to the spiritual. At the same time, arriving in the United States in the late 1960s, Nascimento witnessed a, a different situation in the status of African descendants there and in Brazil. Uh, he saw what organized American black groups had been able to gain greater equality in the U.S. He met members of the Black Panther in Oakland and uh, the poet Leroy Jones of the Black Arts Movement. And he also contacted with established artists such as Jeff Donaldson, co-founder to the All Black Artist Group, Africobra, and whose members worked to create a socially responsible art with its own set of aesthetic paradigms. In a certain way, uh, Liberdade para Rui, o Molo Azul número 3, is an unusual painting of Abidias. It's the only one that he uses college. Uh, at the same time, <coughs> few of his artworks of the, the period are so figurative as this one. Uh, and likewise, it's the painting that bears evidence Abidia's solidarity with the civil rights, civil rights movement and the Black Panthers' struggles. So here you can see better the, this painting. You can see Omolu uh, painted as uh, in blue, maybe because of the sad situation. And in one of his hands, the face, a college with the face of Huey. And it's a very interesting and uh, important uh, painting to to make this connection with uh, the activism of uh, Abidias and his solidarity with uh, the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Prize. Uh, this is another one. It is, you can see it's more uh, abstract. 
Padé de Sou. Issou is the origin of uh, uh, the movement. He is also considered a, a messenger. He is the origin of the crossroads and he used to open the ways. And Padé is a kind of offer that people use to do to the Orishas in a bowl and they put the food that the Orisha likes to eat in a bowl and put it in, a, uh, in the crossroads because the crossroads is, is the space, the intersection between the, the spiritual life and the real life and I want to show another one that's uh, Tema para Lea Garcia. This one is more uh, figurative. Lea Garcia, it's a tribute to Lea Garcia, an important uh, black activist in Brazil. And the Chumaré is the origin of uh, the rivers, the waterfalls, and also the origin of the of beauty. So this is the tribute that uh, Abidias paid to Lea Garcia. And it's important to know that uh, Abidias was a professor here, but he never learned English. So uh, in this uh, he, this declaration about this, he, he, he tells us why he decided to paint in here. And uh, I read to you, you can read as well, but uh, something amazing happened to me. And really, by English, I developed a new form of communication. I discovered that I had another form of language within myself. I discovered that I could paint. I would be able to show what no verbot could say. A difficult experience to explain. The most appropriate thing to say that the Orishas have come down and that I paint in a state of intimate communication with the Orishas. So, uh, he believes that the Odysseus come down to him and, and he starts to paint him with their presence. And, yeah, as an epilogue of this uh, presentation about these three artists, I would like to finish with uh, this artwork of Cecilia Vitina uh, called La Pantera Negra Yo. And I, I saw this uh, painting in, in Malma at New York City too. And when I saw this painter and what she uh, said about this painting, I think that is interesting to understand what I'm trying to say about this artwork is in this connection with the coloniality. Uh, Wendy Kuna traveled to New York in 1969 to celebrate the translation of her first book of poetry into English. She became fascinated by the recently formed Black Panther Party. In this self-portrait, Vicuna depicted herself alongside a panther, surrounded by a row of Italian cypress trees, plants from her own garden, and a staircase that, according, according to the artist, leads, leads to the other dimensions. 
Vicuna was inspired by 16th century paintings made by locals of Cusco, Peru, who produced Christian imagery at the direction of uh, Spanish uh, missionaries. She replaced the Christian saints with personal iconography and painted the scene in a deliberately flat style. Uh, and then she said, for me, painting poorly was a rebellion against the colonial standards that we, the colonized, were expected to submit to. Today, we could call it a decolonizing act. Back then, we call it liberation. Yeah. Thank you.